I know I often harp on the dangers of nuclear energy on this show. In fact, I've called it technological insanity. After all, with the risk of radioactive disaster and no legitimate long-term waste storage plan, what else can you call it? But what if there was a nuclear alternative that could safely and effectively generate clean energy? This nuclear option might exist with thorium, an element three to four times more abundant than uranium. So to explain everything in detail, that is thorium and the possibilities of this potentially revolutionary technology, I was joined earlier by David Martin, chief executive at the Weinberg Foundation. I started it by asking him why thorium is a better alternative to uranium and plutonium. For nuclear energy purposes, we really need to separate between thorium as a fuel, that's for the element, and uh, thorium-fueled reactors. Um, I think there's, um, you know, there's, there's some, sometimes some confusion between the two. And I, you know, both have, have, have advantages and both have some uh, you know, technical challenges and also perhaps some pitfalls as well. But I think in both cases, for both the thorium fuels and the thorium reactors, the, the advantages far outweigh the, the disadvantages. Um, a thorium fuel would be one that would, would be a, a type of fuel that would go in a traditional, a conventional uh, reactor, so the current generation of reactors. So, um, a light water reactor, for instance, or a heavy water reactor, the, the kind of reactors that we've had for about the last 50 years, uh, by and large, around the world. Um, now, thorium fuel in those types of reactors would um, be, it has a higher melting point, so uh, you have higher safety margins. Um, it has a whole bunch of physical characteristics that make it a little more stable um, than perhaps more stable, I should say, because the tests are still coming in. Um, but um, it appears as though it will make it more stable, uh, slightly more resilient, uh, even when used in current reactors. And if it's used in current reactors, then you can mix it up with uh, plutonium or, or other, perhaps other, other types of nuclear waste um, and uh, use it as a way of getting rid of that waste. Um, now, the thorium fueled reactors are the really, you know, the, the, the the molten salt reactor, I think, is what most people think of as the thorium reactor. And the molten salt reactor is something that is, um, it's a step change potentially in, in how we produce nuclear energy, but perhaps even how we, a paradigm shift in how we produce all of our electri uh, electricity at the moment. I'm going to jump in here. Uh, why sure. is thorium currently dumped as waste instead of being used for energy purposes? And why wasn't thorium the primary element used when developing nuclear energy? Um, well, it wasn't used to begin with primarily. I mean, there are two main reasons, right? Um, the first reason is, is fundamentally the bomb. Um, at the time that the, the nuclear industry, the, the nuclear energy industry was being developed, it was um, really, the, everybody will, you speak to will agree that the primary focus was on producing plutonium uh, and uh, fissile isotopes for, for nuclear bombs. This was the heyday of the Cold War, the 1950s, 1960s, 70s. Um, and thorium doesn't produce any readily weaponizable waste. Um, in fact, the, the wastes that come out of thorium are actually pretty difficult to handle frankly, and, and would actually really inhibit somebody who wanted to build a bomb. Um, the other side of it was, so there was the bomb, if thorium doesn't produce weaponizable material, and the second side of it was that the, is that thorium is fertile, so um, you have to have something to kickstart it, uh, which is called a fissile driver. And at the time, in the 50s and 60s, there wasn't really much fissile material around, um, so they were really unable to consider starting up thorium reactors until the, the late 60s. Talk about the four-year thorium reactor test going on right now in Norway. What has been discovered so far and how far do we still have to go until this is viable technology? Those tests are specifically to, to develop a fuel that will um, be able to be mixed with, with plutonium, so it will be a good way of getting rid of the world's stock, stockpile of plutonium. Um, I think they will have a, a fuel on the market probably within about five years, um, certainly within the decade. Um, in terms of the, the more radical reactors, the molten salt reactors, which are you know really the sort of almost the holy grail of, of nuclear energy, um, I think we're probably looking at a bit longer. Um, if we were to have a big push, you know, if we could go to the moon inside of eight years. I think we could build a, a thorium molten salt reactor fairly quickly. But for a real, you know, on the timescales and the budgets that we've got available at the moment, sorry, the resources and the budgets we've got at the moment, um, I, I think we'll. It's going to be a bit of a long haul, you know, maybe 15 to 20 years. Um, but what we really want to start to see, and what we are starting to see, are governments and um, energy corporations that are thinking outside of the box, um, and private inventors as well, um, really beginning to crack this problem. So um, I think if there was um, a major effort, um, an international push to, to develop these, these uh, molten salt reactors, 
perhaps to combat climate change, then we could probably have something ready within 15 years. David, you're talking years. about uh, all these amazing capabilities that Thorium has, uh, almost zero waste, um, completely much more clean than the normal reactors that we're seeing now. I, I'll just clarify quickly, Thorium reactors of all types will still produce some waste. Um, it's just that the, if you're talking about a molten salt reactor, the waste is far reduced and uh, it, 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 it's a complicated question. But you know, they, they would produce less long-lived waste, let's put it that way. Well, well um, before you move on, the, can you actually break um, down, David, yeah. can you break down the waste question really quickly? Because I think that people yep. would appreciate, what do you mean by that? Yeah, sure, okay. Okay, right, well, um, when, when <laughs> one of the problems with the conventional reactors that we have at the moment, it's not a, you know, it's an issue, is that the solid fuel rods essentially uh, part of them becomes degraded over time, so you have to take the fuel out when, when you've only burned up about 3% of the fuel in the rod. Um, that's one of the issues, one of the reasons that we have a, an issue with high level, what's called high level radioactive waste. Um, now, if you have a molten salt reactor, then you, because the fuel is liquid, uh, you can just pass the fuel around the reactor continuously and burn up all of the, all of the, the what are called the actinides um, in the reactor, uh, which means that the waste that comes out, uh, I mean, you're not going to want to drink it, but the waste that comes out is, is, is far less long-lived, you know, would be, would be safe within about 300 years. Um, however, being nuclear physics, it's a little more complicated than that in that uh, for, the, for the 300 years, that, some of that waste may be actually a little more, more intensely radioactive or harder to handle um, than, than even conventional waste. I just want to just want to clarify something on this on this waste issue as well um, regarding conventional nuclear um, the waste I think there's a there's a there's a lot of um, uh, you know misconceptions about the waste here if your entire life were to be powered by nuclear energy the current generation of nuclear energy if your entire life were to be powered by it it would produce uh, this, the amount of high level waste it would produce would fit inside a coke can um, so, you know, the uh, people are often surprised to hear this. You know, we need to start thinking in terms of volumes of waste rather than uh, a tonnage of waste. Nuclear waste being very dense means uh, that it's very heavy but doesn't take up very much space. Um, so even with the current technology, it ain't that bad. We're talking about a Coke can for our entire lives, and that's for air travel, car, uh, electric, uh, car so use. So you're saying things. that the, the current waste that we're seeing with the nuclear reactors on Earth today, the waste is not as bad as it's made out to be. Is that what you're saying? Um, I think obviously it needs to be stored securely, uh, it needs to be handled well, it is, it is handled well at the moment in general. I mean I do have to um, disagree with you because I see uh, day after day just stories fine. of nuclear waste not being able to be stored properly um, and it is really terrifying I think for people to understand how long lasting it is even I, if it is some, a small amount. Yeah. A lot of the, wa the waste that we have at the moment can actually be reconverted into fuel. So um, it's actually, it still contains a lot of energy. It's just that we need to develop the kinds of reactors, uh, what are called fast spectrum reactors, that can actually, that we have got reactors that, that are capable of using the waste we have as fuel and breaking it up. Um, and making it less radioactive, okay? So we, there's, the UK, for instance, has a stockpile of plutonium at Sellafield that in the right reactor, an advanced reactor, a fast reactor, could uh, power the entire country for about 500 years. Um, so, you know, with, with nuclear waste, we do have lots of options. We could, we could put them back in the right kinds of reactors and generate electricity from it. After Fukushima, I think that many people, including me, are wary of pursuing any type of nuclear power or any type of nuclear energy. Why should people believe this is a smart and safe way to tackle our energy problems when we have more clean energy available, geothermal, solar, wind, wave, etc.? I think we have to think about the, the, the global, the scale of the problem that we face globally. Um, for me, the reason I do the job that I do is because I'm uh, an environmentalist. I always have been an environmentalist and I'm worried about climate change. Um, however, I also I want a bright future for, if I do one day have children, I'd like a bright future for my children and my children's children. Um, now, if we look at the global picture, uh, it's clear that energy use is, is, is accelerating. Um, we sadly the carbon emissions uh, greenhouse gas emissions are still accelerating we have barely started to even slow the the rate of increase there um, so we've got a major problem um, you know the IPCC said that we've only really got about 30 years to to, to sort of pretty much decarbonize our entire economy um, and you know at the moment there's only one way of doing that and that's through primarily decarbonizing your energy use um, and there's only one country on the planet, really, that's managed to decarbonize fully um, and, that's, and maintain a high level of living. 
uh, high standard of living for its inhabitants, and that's France, uh, which has 80% nuclear and some of the cleanest air in Europe. Um, so I think we need to look globally here. You know, we've got a rising. I, I would like to see you know lo people around the planet be pulled out of poverty, and one of the best ways of doing that is through cheap energy. Um, now all these coal plants and everything, they're, they're all in the pipeline anyway. China's building thousands of coal plants, we know that. We need to find a replacement for those. Um, they're not going to go back in the box. And renewables have a, have a great role to play, as does energy efficiency. We need to use energy more, far more efficiently, um, but as does geothermal as well. But those technologies are just simply not enough. David Martin, Chief Executive Weinberg Foundation, really appreciate you coming on.